Welcome back indeed. Today we're going to be taking a look at the revised edition of the Blue and Gray Quadra Game System published by TSR in 1984. In particular we'll be looking at the Cemetery Hill game. By way of introduction Blue and Gray is a two-player game recreating four of the most important battles of the American Civil War, Shiloh, Antietam, Gettysburg, and Chickamauga. Each of these battles is represented by one of the four scenarios in the game. The two players, Union and Confederate, take the roles of the generals who commanded the troops of each side in the battle. During the course of the game, the players take turns moving pieces representing troops across the battle map and using them to attack other players troops. The Cemetery Hill Gettysburg scenario recreates the battle between the Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia at the town of Gettysburg Pennsylvania. Game parts the parts list a complete copy of this game includes a 16 page rule book one back printed map sheet, one sheet of 400 cardboard playing pieces, two six-sided die, dice, one plastic storage tray, and one game box. The map is printed on both sides and shows the areas where the four battles were fought. A hex grid has been laid over the maps to help control the movement of the pieces. Each hex represents 400 meters of real terrain and each hex contains its own four-digit number that is used throughout the game to refer to that hex. We also have a turn record track, a terrain effects chart, terrain key, and a combat results table. The map is printed on paper and as stated before has a hexagonal grid superimposed over it to regulate the posi positioning of the units for movement and combat purposes. The terrain is highly stylized and consists of um, clear, forest, rough, uh, let's see, we have bridge hexides, creek hexides, and roads. We also have a forest and rough hex, which is Cemetery Hills, Shiloh, and Chickamauga only maps. We have uh, town hexes, Ford hex sides, and that's all on the Cemetery Hill map. The other games will use some of the other types of terrain not represented on this map. The playing pieces or counters or units represent the various military units which were just participated in the actual battle or could have participated in the actual battle. Um, each side's pieces are denoted by separate colors. The Union of course is the blue and the Confederates are the gray. They have various uh, information printed on them. The Union unit has two stars representing that it is a division. It also has its uh, unit identification on the left hand side which I believe this is the third division of the first core. It also has the unit type the box with the cross lines in the middle represents uh, infantry and it has a combat strength of 15. This information um, is the same on the Confederate unit However, it only has one X representing a brigade. It is the um, first brigade of Heth, um, Heth's division. It has an infantry unit symbol and it has a combat strength of 10. Some units have the setup hex printed on the back. The Union unit, for example, will set up and start the game in hex 06. One zero, sixteen ten. Some units enter as reinforcements. The information is given as the Confederate unit will enter 
the game as a reinforcement on game turn two, and it will enter at hex 0104. I do want to state quickly that the counters are glossy finished and they come with uh, at least four nubs when attached to their um, counter tree so trimming them up and making them look pretty will take some work. Their thickness is adequate for this game and that's about all I have to say about that. The map contains the terrain key which identifies the various types of terrain you will find on any given map. Each map has its own terrain key. Also printed on the map is the combat results table. Um, one is printed uh, in one direction and the other one is printed in the opposite direction. Also printed on the map is the turn record track, um, which is used, of course, to keep uh, track of which game turn it is and when units will appear, reinforcement units, what turn they'll appear. Over here I have a photocopy of the combat results table again and the explanation of the combat results and then we have the actual effects of the terrain on the terrain effects chart. Um, this is printed in on the back of the rules book and it tells the different types of terrain what game they apply to how many movement points it costs to enter a hex or cross a hex side and any effects they may have on combat. Um, all units have a set movement allowance of six movement points. So you can see that entering a force in rough hex is going to cost all of your movement, whereas moving across forest or rough hexes costs three movement points each. And entering a clear, terex, a clear terrain hex obviously costs one movement point. I do want to touch upon one point. The game scale, as stated earlier, each hexagon on the map represents 400 meters of real terrain from side to side. And then we have each strength point represents between 250 and 350 men. The rules are printed on a are printed on a matte finish with a few examples of play um, which are also in black and white. The sequence of play is fairly uh, straightforward. As you can see the game is played in successive game turns composed of alternate player turns. During each player turn the player maneuvers his units and resolves combat in sequence according to the following outline and within the limits provided by the rules which follow. So we have basically the first player turn and a second player turn. The actual scenarios will tell you which uh, side has or is the first player or the second player. Basically we have the first, <clears throat> first player turn which consists of a movement phase and a combat phase and then we have a second player turn which is basically the repeat of the first player's turn and then we have the game turn record interface in which we move the turn record uh, marker to the next turn. The game has a stacking limit of two units per hex however I like to play with a house rule which, stay, which I prohibit infantry and cavalry units from stacking in the same hex together. Only one infantry unit. Uh, let's, re let's rephrase that. Two infantry units or two cavalry units in a hex, um, but you can't stack infantry with cavalry. Artillery can stack with itself and with either cavalry or infantry. Um, all units can participate in an attack with no penalty. However, with a retreat, 
Um, you cannot retreat into, obviously cavalry can't retreat into infantry hexes. They will have to displace or retreat an additional hex following the regular um, retreat rules for combat. There are zones of control. They're pretty much standard. No zones of control across a river, I think, or stream hexide. Combat is pretty much adjacent. Uh, enemy and friendly units adjacent to one another. Um, we do have... <clears throat> let's see, where is it at? Soak-offs are allowed. And we do have uh, artillery units, which can fire up to three hexes, provided they have a line of sight. Or they can help with the offensive combat. Or they can bombard as well. I don't know if they can help with defensive combat. I'll have to reread that. The rules I have here are the um, standard rules to the blue and gray set that came probably with the originals. Uh, so I'm just using them as a brief... Uh, uh, to use them as a brief uh, overview because it's better than trying to fight my way through the rule book <clears throat> and film at the same time. Anyway, we do have the optional rule on attack effectiveness, effectiveness, which will be used. However, here on the old rules, you know, you could not uh, uh, reorganize a unit or flip it over to its effective side except in night terms. In the revision, you can roll a die and try to get a one and uh, <clears throat> to uh, recover from, recover attack effectiveness. Uh, I don't know if it's during the movement phase or when, but if you roll a one, um, you get to recover and nighttime, of course, <clears throat> you uh, recover completely. So we'll see how that works. Um, other than that, it's pretty much a straightforward, straightforward game, um, based on the um, Napoleon at Waterloo game system, um, modified for the Civil War. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and show a few moves, a few turns, and uh, that'll probably be it. This represents. The initial setup for both sides. Um, most of the units are shown in this picture. There's a couple that are not, but that's not going to be a big deal right now. This is going to be the start of game turn one. The Confederates will be player one. The Union will be player two. One caveat, I have not played this particular game. I have played um, Chickamauga several times but um, this will be the first playthrough of Cemetery Hill and I've also played the Antietam game so this will be uh, basically a beginner's look at this game and therefore there will be no attempts to demonstrate strategy tactics uh, any kind of winning winning strategy that type of thing basically going to be just a brief overview of the game and game system and we'll do some movement and we'll do some combat we'll do uh, some reinforcements um, show you how artillery works see how my stacking home rule works and I guess we'll proceed um, proceed from there there are 15 game turns um, composed of four daylight turns and one night turn per day, um, except for the last day and the first day only have two turns of daylight. Um, let's see, first day, second day, third day, so I guess the last uh, two turns could be considered July 4th. Um, anyway, um, Lost my train of thought here real quick. Oh, um, it looks to me that since the first day is so short and only has two game turns, that we're starting pretty much in the afternoon of the first day since most of the Confederate units 
are in their what late afternoon positions I guess you would say and the union player has plugged has plugged most of the gaps or is in the process of plugging uh, most of the gaps it looks like the Confederates are still driving on Gettysburg and controlling the uh, and trying to push back the Union player to its historic um, positions so with that when I come back we are going to uh, start turn one unless I find other things I want to talk about before that okay so the Confederate player will move first this uh, doesn't tell me what time or whatever so I'm just gonna say it's like I said early to late afternoon so Confederate player will go first um, gets to move all his units and perform combat and then the Union player will do the same if I make any glaring mistakes such as confusing which player goes first uh, combat movement please let me know in a you know civilized manner like I said I this will be my first real play of the game, so um, expect uh, mistakes to be made. <clears throat> Sorry, I have horrible sinus problems, and they're seasonal, which means they basically last all year long. So <clears throat> we will start. We're going to move Heth, and I don't know if it's Heth, Heath, whatever. Um, his first brigade, uh, one movement point, and we stop in zones of control. So we'll move them up against uh, Union 1st Cavalry of the 1st Corps, I think is how that is. Anyway, we'll move him there. The terrain that the Union Cavalry unit occupies will provide no benefit. Woods have no benefit. Only rough woods, rough um, attacking across certain, uh, like a bridge, uh, forest and rough in towns and stuff will provide any sort of uh, defensive benefit which mostly doubles your defense except for let me see nope even the uh, forest and rough is only double I thought there was one that was tripled but I don't see that right now so anyway onwards and upwards uh, rough is gonna cost what three movement points out of six so I guess we'll go one two three four five six rough will double that to 18 so I think that's a fairly safe move um, I want that to be geez I'm not sure let's go up here into a rough hex stopping there Pinder will move here, and the artillery will move up here as well, making that a 14. Now, is that going to make a difference in odds, you know, factoring in stuff? I have no idea. If I was going to take my time, I'd probably factor in <clears throat> every factor I needed to uh, get the odds that I want, but... Um, it's not really important for me at this point. We are going to move the Confederate uh, unit up there to engage that uh, Union unit. We're going to also move the Confederate unit there, adjacent to the Union unit. Uh, if I was paying more attention, I would uh, keep everything in view here. Let's see. <coughs> Uh, I'm not sure what to do with uh, Rhodes Brigade here. If I move it up here, this is kind of a rough uh, woods. He's going to be doubled to 22. Uh, 14 and 4 is 18, so I will still be at a disadvantage. Um, not quite sure what I want to do there. Up top here... I'm going to move Early's Brigade, one hex, and attempt to engage the um, Union Cavalry unit there. Other than that, 
I have this artillery piece, which like I said, he's doubled to 22. His attack is only 11 though. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and he'll move 1, 2, 3. Now making that basically a what? 14, that'd be what? 18. He'll be attacking at 1 to 2 if he attacks. But I will have a <clears throat> Confederate player has to attack first, so uh, at 1 to 2, there's a good chance that we'll be thrown back. And there's a 1 in 6 chance that we will be eliminated, so we're just going to have to take that risk. Okay, when I come back, we're going to do combat. Okay, I have 6 combats. I'm going to resolve them in order. Um, I suppose if you were using some sort of uh, strategic or tactical um, plan, you would arrange them better than I do in order to take advantage of the retreat and advance rules, that type of thing, but I'm just giving examples of combat regardless of whether it's a uh, tactically sound um, engagement or not. So anyway, we're going to do the first battle. <clears throat> The Heath uh, Infantry Brigade versus the Union Cavalry Brigade. The Cavalry Brigade gains no defensive benefits since it's only in woods, and woods do not provide any kind of benefit. I guess we'll call them forests. I guess that's what the game calls them, so we'll call them forests. So it looks to me like 10 divided by 4 is going to be 2 to 1. So we're going to roll on the 2 to 1 column. Let me see if I can find a combat results table here that's free. And let me see if I can get that in frame. Mm. You may have to look at it from the side, I'm afraid. Yeah, let's see here. Let's try something else. Perhaps I should have photocopied this part. So, first battle is going to be at 2 to 1 odds. And there's six possible results. The die is rolled, and we get a 5, which is not good. So that's going to be an AR or attacker retreat. So there was a 33% chance of that, and unfortunately, that's what I rolled. So we're going to move back up here <clears throat> into the um, forest rough. Um, let me see. I don't think the defender can advance, but let me double check. It's always good to review the rules before you start uh, filming, but hey, we don't need to worry about that. Let me see. Attacker removes. If the defender vacated a hex during step 7, the attacker can now advance. Uh, one of the units that attacked. A unit cannot advance more than one hex. Advancing units cannot attack or be attacked. Advancing during this step is always... Um, voluntary. So, from what I read, does not say anything about the defender advancing. So, we shall move on to combat number two here. Uh, let me see here. We have 10 and 4 is 14 plus 12. And no, I will not do math on the fly. We're looking at 26 to basically 22. So, it's going to be a 1 to 1 attack. Um, it's going to be a 50% chance of a attacker retreat and a 50% chance of uh, a defender retreat. I roll a 3, and a 3 at 1 to 1 is going to be a defender retreat. Remove the battle uh, marker. Uh, make sure I'm even showing the right thing. So we want to. Um, I really don't want to fall back to the uh, southern position here, but I guess we could fall back there. Um, not quite sure what that's going to do. If we can advance one unit. We will advance Pinder here. Yeah, Pinder. Whatever. Now we're going to go on to the third battle. This is going to be a tougher one. It's going to be, what, 
14 to 22. I'm guessing that's 1 to 2. Don't think it's anything. Uh, uh, yeah, it looks like a 1 to one to 2. So, this is going to be... Eh, this is probably going to wind up uh, a disaster for the Confederates. But let's see. Anything but a 6 would be nice. And a roll of 2. And a 2 is actually a defender retreat. Best possible um, result we could have got. So I think they are going to fall back to here. Ooh, wait a minute. They, yeah, they're only doubled. There is no tripling. I could have swore there was a tripling in here, but it doesn't look like there is. Okay, so anyway, they fall back one. We can advance one. Yeah, he was just doubled. He'll advance uh, the Confederate in the Infantry Brigade. That's Rhodes. Okay, that was battle three. Now we're going to go up to battle four. Oops, sorry about that. It was very unprofessional. <clears throat> okay, so we have Rhodes versus um, X111 Corps uh, Division. First Division, 11th Corps. If I'm saying these things wrong, let me know. Looks like it's going to be a one to one battle. 50 50, we roll a one. Defender retreat. So the Confederates are making good progress on day one here. Uh, we want to maintain. Oops. Sorry. We want to maintain um, a zone of control, um, coherent, uh, connecting zones of control if we can. So, I don't know where coherent came. From must be because I'm not coherent at the moment. So we'll advance the Confederate uh, Rhodes Brigade. Okay, and then we have Battle Five, which is going to be another one to one. Um, nobody has any kind of defensive benefit. Um, did I have? I had an attacker. Re no, I did not have. Yes, I did have an attacker retreat. Way down south here. Uh, let's see here. I had an attacker retreat right here, which means that Heath should be uh, attacker effectiveness <clears throat> is effectiveness ugh, effectiveness. Um, now, ah, what are the right terms here? Just a moment, please. He has been rendered um, combat ineffective. So, he'll have to either roll a 1 during his next combat phase or wait till nightfall to become uh, undisordered. That's what they call it here in the TSR version. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see where they actually call it uh, what the effects are of a disordered unit. Basically, I think it can move, but it can't attack, that type of thing. And it has to retreat if it is adjacent to an enemy unit. Don't worry about that next time. Okay, well, we're back on track here. Let's go back over here to Battle 5. And let's see. Great. Did I roll that one already? Or not? I don't think I did, but if I did, well, correct me on it. It's a one, so that's going to be a defender retreat at one to one. So the Union forces continually, continually are forced back. I guess that's semi-historical. If I'd already resolved that battle or something, you know, no big deal. Like I said, this is trying to be just kind of an example of how this works. All right, in the final battle will be Early's Brigade versus um, um, one of the uh, Union Cavalry units. I don't I don't know which unit is which um, based upon their um, Division Corps Brigade uh, numbering. So um, 
they're both they basically equate to you know what Devin gamble that type of thing but <clears throat> without some kind of uh, cheat sheet with me I you know it's whatever so really in uh, focus here there we go so it's gonna be a two to one there is no terrain <clears throat> No terrain modifiers or anything like that. So two to one. We roll a one, two to one. That's another defender retreat. I think we're going to retreat across the bridge and we'll let him advance. And that pretty much is the Confederate turn. Uh, game turn one. It looks like they had success everywhere except uh, down south. Or actually, that's... Yeah, to the west. So when I come back, we will see what the Union player can do in response. And then after that, well, I'll probably move on to some other game. Okay, now let's take a look at the Union half of turn one. Once again, it's going to start with their movement phase. The units which are adjacent to Confederate units cannot move. Um, so long as they're they're in the zone of control, like I say, that river or Rock Creek, I guess it is, uh, prohibits a zone of control um, from being exerted across the river. So the cavalry unit up north there, or north, it's not north, in the east, cannot move because of the Confederate infantry unit. So let's see. Uh, <clears throat> Union units there off about center screen are free to move as well as the Union Cavalry unit uh, down to the south of the picture or frame, whatever and this uh, Union Infantry Division which is moving up the Emmitsburg Road so let me do a little thinking here and then we shall focus in uh, on the Union movement. Okay, let's start here with the uh, Union Infantry Division. Rhodes cost one, um, so he can move a maximum of six hexes through the rough and wooded rough terrain. Um, basically all it does is just negate all the terrain in each hex that it uh, the road runs through. So. There's no extended movement, uh, no special rules for, you know, like half a movement on roads type of thing. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. As they rush to their comrades' aid. All right. Now what to do with this uh, cavalry unit down here? It's not really occupying any kind of defensive terrain. But if I move it too far away, I'm going to leave a gap. Since this uh, Union unit here can't move, if I move it too far away, say over to here, they both have zones of control, but this unit's probably going to face a retreat. So, But with the other Union uh, unit coming in, I don't know. Anyway, it's not that important. It's just a, kind of an example. So we're going to move him up into these... Uh, rough wooded uh, areas <clears throat> area so nobody else there can move nobody else can move because he's supposed to be right here uh, let's see here I seem to have uh, this unit should still be flipped over Uh, yeah, something like that. Anyway, I need to start taking notes. So when I come back to something, I can remember what I was doing. Oh well, like I said. Okay, let's see here. After a brief, um, a brief thought or two, I think I'm going to move this Union Division here. One, two, three, four, five, and just put him there for the moment. Kind of give support to this Union Cavalry unit. Uh, next turn, there's quite a few Confederate units coming on board. 
as well as a single union uh, reinforcement. So <clears throat> they're probably going to have be forced back anyway. And the two union uh, divisions, twelves. I think we're just going to move them up towards Gettysburg, and we'll see where they they are going to be needed. Looking at the Confederate entry hexes, it doesn't look like there's anything that can uh, <clears throat> come in behind them at the moment. So, to make things easy, one, two, three, four, five, six, we'll just move up to here. Kind of that way we can kind of go uh, whichever direction we're needed, and I think that'll probably apply to the other one as well. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that, once I get my fat hand out of the way, will complete the Union Movement phase. Then we're going to have combat. So I'm going to have to go mark my combats, figure them out, and then we'll resolve combat. Okay, ironically, I have six combats to resolve, just like uh, during the Confederate term. We are going to start with... Uh, appropriately, appropriately, number one here. Yeah, let's see. There we go. We're in the picture now. Looks like it's going to be 15 to 18 or 1 to 2. And I roll a 1. Uh, and that is a defender retreat. So, we'll force him back. And I will advance into the vacated hex. And that's uh, combat 1. Then we have combat 2. This is going to be... 11 to 20, so it looks like a 1 to 2. Um, so we'll roll again. Like I said, if my math is wrong, please uh, gently remind me. Uh, we have a 2 at 1 to 2, and that is also a defender retreat. So it looks like the Union player is getting some good die rolls, just like the Confederate player did. Uh, do I want to advance, though? <clears throat> If I advance, I pin these units. They will have to attack. But how does that open up? Uh, yeah, I think I will because if he he'll have to attack this unit at unfavorable odds. So if I move him there, these guys can't move and will be forced to attack him. Probably it may be I don't know one to one or so, but still, there's an even chance that he'll remain in that hex or at least be retreated back here and besides it pins these confederate units there <clears throat> the next attack number three try to get a little closer here uh... we have eleven to twenty eight so doing a quick calculation here uh... point zero four I'm going to say that, let's see, 11 to 28, 22 to 28. I'm going to say it's 1 to 2. I know you always round down the odds in favor of the defender. <clears throat> um, it's either 1 to 2 or 1 to 3. Either way, the results are pretty much the same, except there is one less defender retreat result. result. So anyway, I'm going to go with 1 to 2. Cut the Confederates uh, some slack if that's how it is. But we roll a 5 at 1 to 2, and that's an attacker retreat. So, if I retreat here, we still exert zones of control into these hexes. And I think that's what I'm going to do. A key battle, I guess, will be number 4 of them. Um, we'll see what happens with that one. So it looks like it's going to be one to two for sure this time. I roll a five at one to two, and that is an attacker retreat. So I kind of, uh, I didn't expect it, but at least uh, I, well, I'm prepared, I was prepared for it, I guess you could say. Um... Anyway, the retreat. I know I'm not making any sense. I apologize for that. Okay. Now we're going to combat number five. Which is pretty much... 
Why did I say 9 to 11? Man, I am totally out of it today. I apologize. Anyway, that was 1 to 2. Next one will be a 1 to 2 also. Attack number 5. <clears throat> see how that goes. Roll the 1. That is a defender retreat. Uh, I guess they would just fall back to here. And there will be no advance after combat. Because I'm afraid that this unit can be uh, surrounded and then eliminated with zone, enemy zones of control. <clears throat> Hard my hand again. And last and least <clears throat> is attack number six up here. This one is across a bridge hex side. And let's see. Defender is double if all attacking units are attacking across that hex side, so he's 22. This is going to be a very unhappy result here. Uh, looks like it's going to be on the 1 to 5 table, from what I can tell. Rounding down, up, whatever. Um, I think he used the last column uh, on the chart, so we are going to roll at 1 to 5, which has a 50% chance of eliminating the cavalry unit and 50% chance of just forcing the cavalry unit back. And we roll high, which eliminates the Union Cavalry unit. So the Confederates have <clears throat> um, have taken the bridge and will be able to cross it before the uh, Union can respond. So that is pretty much what the blue and gray system is like. Pretty simple, pretty fast playing if you're just playing it and not filming it. Um, it's a golden oldie from the days of SBI. And I don't know, I've heard things about some of the scenarios aren't particularly well balanced or don't make a, uh, you know, a challenging game or whatever, but I don't have enough experience with it to, you know, say one way or the other. I like it. I wish I had the original SBI version. Because I'm not a big fan of glossy counters and stuff like that. Um, I prefer the way the SPI counters look and feel and that type of thing. So anyway, if it was a Confederate combat phase again, I just want to try to get uh, talk about the disorder rule or attack effectiveness um, rule. It's different in uh, the original version and the uh, revision, but it's pretty much the same rule. <laughs> So if it was a Confederate combat phase, the uh, unit, this unit here would have to roll uh, to see if it uh, recovers or if it has to retreat. I roll a three, so it would be forced to retreat. Probably this way. Assuming that this unit will be forced to retreat for attacking a <coughs> defender doubled unit there to 30. So anyway, that's back into focus here. There we go. That's pretty much uh, the blue and gray system. Um, so I think I'm going to cut it off here and we will proceed to another game. Thanks for watching. Um, sorry for all the um, goofs and rambling commentary. Um, anyway, I will catch you later. Thanks.